Hello. Uh, thank you, really. Uh, and I just got promoted just five years ago. <laughs> so uh, I'm an associate professor right now. OK, but I'm going to talk about uh, a very exciting uh, technology that we've been investigating, uh, coarse-grained reconfigurable arrays. Uh, so uh, uh, by this topic, actually, this uh, systolic arrays or coarse-grained reconfigurable arrays have been around for a long time. And essentially what they are is a 2D grid of uh, processing elements, where each processing element is extremely simple, right? which has just an ALU and a uh, local register file. And each PE can take its inputs from its neighbors. So for example, this PE can take the input from the left one, right one, and operate on it. And then it can write its output in this register. And then in the next cycle, its neighboring PEs can use that. Right, so like a data flow architecture, so very simple. Uh, so these have been very interesting because uh, they people have achieved very high power efficiencies using these uh, architectures, and uh, we have a very good, uh, you know, I mean, good proof that they are being used in many embedded systems. So the challenge here has been to use this in more general purpose setting and uh, in high performance computing is uh, programming for them, like com compiling for them. So this chart actually shows essentially the whole compilation procedure. So if you have a loop, uh, so first of all, these CGRAs are typically uh, envisioned to be used as, uh, as an accelerator to accelerate loops. And uh, unlike GPUs, CGRAs can also accelerate loops that have uh, loop carry dependencies. So this is an example which shows a loop carry dependency where A of i is dependent of B of i minus 1. And so this is the data flow graph of this loop. So you can see this A is dependent on B from the previous iteration. And this dependency is shown with a weight of 1. Right? So this is a data carry dependency. The rest are normal. B of i is dependent on the previous output. So that is fine and this, this. So uh, if you want to map this on a 1 cross 2 CGRA, just for simplicity, so you can extend the CGRA in time, so in three times, three cycles, and you can map A, B, C, D here, and then you can restart the same schedule starting from cycle 3. So this schedule, uh, we, the performance metric of the schedule is this II, or initiation interval. And this process is called software pipelining. Because uh, like if you look at this third iteration, an instruction of iteration 2 and an instruction of iteration 1 are executing simultaneously. And the reason why uh, CGRAs can accelerate even non-parallel loops is because it accelerates using pipelining, so which is always possible. So there has been a lot of work recently. Uh, they are, CGRAs are being surging up. People and especially, I think the uh, machine learning community has uh, has uh, is very interested in using CGRAs for uh, accelerating the machine learning applications. So uh, this is a new patent from uh, Intel, which was just uh, granted them last month, and it shows that they think that the CGRA lies here in the graph of throughput versus, versus energy per operation. So as compared to the regular processor pipelines, this is extremely power efficient and, and has high throughput. So uh, the reasons, I think some of the reasons are that uh, the CGRA can have pre-decoded instructions. So the instruction decode power is minimal. Uh, second, it uh, has it can accelerate even all kind of loops, like even non-parallel loops. Third, it, uh, it, it not all instructions need to write to the register file and read from the register file. They can just exchange the data uh, here and there. So it's it's very very good. Okay. So the key is that if uh, program if the compiler can take on the job of compilation, then it would be very nice because. Uh, all the uses that we see in embedded systems, people are actually manually programming this. OK, so this is the main thing here. And we have a public release of the first version of a compiler and simulation framework 
for the CGRA. So I'll just go through this very quickly. So in our framework, you have these loops and you can mark a loop with this pragma CGRA, right, for example. So then this loop will be mapped onto the CGRA and accelerated. So uh, you just have to, in the make file, you have to remove GCC and use CGRA CC. And then our compiler will extract the a loop, right? This is an LLVM. Uh, it will draw its data flow graph, right, with the red edges showing the loop carry dependencies. And then it will schedule this loop onto the uh, CGRA. And then it will do the instruction selection. And uh, what it does is that it takes this one program and partitions it into two threads. So the second thread runs the loop on the CGRA. And what we, how we execute is on GEM5. So we have configured a two core GEM5. One core uh, is normal. The second one is a CGRA. So the second thread accelerate, uh, runs on that. And so it can run. So uh, this is uh, on GitHub. Please go and download and test it. How, how it works. OK, so we have been working on this for some time. And we have some very interesting results on this. Uh, so uh, in DAC 2012, we presented a, actually uh, most of the mapping algorithms that work on uh, how to map these graphs onto CGRA, they are usually very ad hoc. right? They take one node from the data flow graph, map it to the CGRA. Then they take another node, then they map that and then they route the dependency between them right through something. Uh, so instead of these ad hoc uh, problems, we, f we found that this problem of mapping this graph onto the CGRA is actually finding an epimorphism in the product graph of the data flow graph and the CGRA. So it's a very nice problem formulation. And uh, please uh, go and check this out. Uh, so then we also developed techniques to use the register file inside the CGRA. Uh, this one uh, figures out what is the right uh, register file architecture to use in a CGRA. And this one tries to accelerate loops with conditionals. Uh, so the recent most paper on this, what we uh, did was uh, that once you have a data dependency in a CGRA, there are various ways to route that data right between PEs. So for example, you can route via PEs. So uh, one PE computes the value, it gives it to the next PE, then it gives to the third PE, fourth PE, and it finally reaches the destination. Or you can route it through the register files inside the PEs. Or you can spill to the memory and read from the memory. Or you can actually do recomputation. So for example, here, uh, if x cannot provide value to both y and z, then you just recompute x then x can provide value to y, and x can provide value to z, and x prime can provide value to y. So there are so many options of uh, routing. So what is the best way to route is this problem formulation, and it finds a neat solution. So once you do this, uh, these are some interesting results on that. What you can see is, uh, OK, so let me explain this slowly. <laughs> the x-axis shows CGRA configurations. right? So these configurations are listed here. So essentially, these are uh, the lower configurations means extremely restricted, resource-constrained CGRAs, like very small CGRAs, very uh, few register number of registers and connections. And as you go towards this direction, you have larger CGRAs, more connections, and more things. So usually, by ad hoc ways, it is easier to map on these larger CGRAs. And what you can see in this graph is that the percentage of or the number of loops that previous techniques can map is very bad for very resource constrained CGRAs while we can still map them. And for all of them, we can get a much better performance than previous approaches. OK, so uh, this, this particular work, uh, we were interested in using the CGRA to accelerate a, a residual neural, neural network, RNN. So RNN features like uh, uh, layers like this, where you have a convolution, normalization scale, ReLU, and then maybe one or two more batches of this. And so there is an input feature map that comes in, and then uh, yeah, you do all of this. 
So one of the things in RNA, R, uh, RNNs is that the amount of uh, the data required for weights and the input feature map can be different among the layers. So towards the front, actually, the input feature map is much larger. And towards the end, as the uh, uh, in feature maps become smaller, this uh, weights can become uh, much more. So this is important because when you are trying to see, OK, what should I reuse? then what data should you reuse, then this kind of information is very important. So this is the high level overview of uh, how we map uh, or accelerate or manage uh, this residual neural network on the CGRA. So assuming we have a 7 cross 7 CGRA with a register file size of about uh, 0.64 kilobyte, we have these 9 cross 9 512 such images or input feature map. And then these are the weights. And there are 512, so 3 cross 3 weights. And there are 512 of these and then 512 filters. And you multiply them to get an output feature map of 7 cross 7. So our strategy here to accelerate this is relatively simplistic. Uh, we use a, uh, a use a mechanism of output is stationary. So yeah, I was missing that word. <laughs> so uh, the idea is to uh, start with this. Uh, so OK, so I think this one makes things more clear. So we have about uh, 2 plus 41 plus 25. That is about 60, 68k of scratch pad memory with the CGRA. And we use about 2K for the filters. So that means that we can load about uh, 32 of these filters at one time in the scratch pad. And we can load some of these images here. And this is the space for output feature map. OK. So uh, this is, uh, so you load the filters onto the, uh, the filter weights onto the CGRA. And note here that we don't assume that all the PEs can simultaneously load the filter values. Actually, they are being distributed. They are being loaded from one place and distributed among the PEs. Right? Um, so they spread around. And then eventually, all the weights are here. And what you can see is the uh, register file status uh, here. So you have uh, 16, 32 channels of filters here. And then you, then we start loading the input feature maps, right? And then you can start computing on them. So, for example, this seven cross, this last PE is computing this partial map. So you, at the end of this, uh, doing 16 such iterations, and then reloading this uh, uh, this uh, uh, filter weights, you eventually calculate the first uh, first image. Now, one of the thing is that. Uh, most of the acceleration schemes before, they actually only accelerate this convolution because this is the mo most compute intensive. But actually, all these things can also be computed while all this data and input output feature map is there in the PE registers. So immediately after we calculate this first output feature, we do the batch normalization scale and ReLU right there in the accelerator itself. We don't need to do it in the CPU. right? And so just to go through this, breeze past these experimental results, we did a very extensive experimental comparison. We uh, ran this on Intel Core i7, pretty good one. We calculated the number of cycles and used and compared this with the number of cycles. This is a cycle by cycle comparison. Uh, and we see some about 6 to 8x speed up. And actually, there are a lot of optimizations still possible on this. and. Uh, uh, like some of these we think will achieve about 4x speed up uh, over on top of this. So uh, I think the main thing is that there is a huge ecosystem around this. This is not, uh, it, the problem is not just the mapping problem, right? There is a, uh, we want to develop the whole flow from the TensorFlow input right down to the compilation and execution of this uh, architecture. And there are a lot of other uh, frameworks that we plan to use for this. So yeah. So uh, that's it.
we have time for a few questions. Is there any uh, efficient uh, algorithm to deal with uh, sparsity, sparsities for the machine learning? See, I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, sparsity matrix time, sparse, uh, not the matrix. Right. So actually, um, in general, this problem is uh, relatively hard, but uh, we have solved uh, some uh, lasso algorithms uh, uh, and that have uh, uh, on sparse matrix. And uh, actually, that also behaves pretty well. So it, it's uh, more like uh, uh, it, it, it is more dependent on the, uh, on the data structures that you create. Uh, so this still doesn't solve the whole problem, right? I mean, the way the programmer writes the program is still very important, right? So if you create the wrong data structures for a sparse matrix, then it is not going to be very, very good. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, could you comment on the overhead between offloading to the accelerator and back for a complete application? Yeah, so actually, uh, so uh, what is the overhead of communication between the core and the CGRA depends on how you attach this, right? So in our model, what we imagine is that the uh, CGRA is attached to each core of the processor. So it's very close to the core, right, rather than on a separate uh, accelerator on a PCI bus, right? We imagine that this being on the chip with the cores. So. Uh, this is this this communication would be just like intercore communication right so you can actually configure the cgra or offload and computation onto the cgra in a few tens of cycles right rather than copying all the data onto another dram and then uh, taking thousands of cycles this is uh, we imagine like tens of cycles so it should be much more efficient Any questions? Uh, have you been thinking about maybe providing some localized memory with the uh, with the um, with, with the, the P's? So that you can. I've seen this at ISCCC uh, in a, several Japanese Im imaging papers. So they can, for instance, store the grid. Uh, and then uh, have some delay or do some uh, in-cell processing? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think, so th that's the whole thing that this uh, design is really open, right? There are so many possibilities in this. I mean, from what is this, how is this PE constructed? If you actually add memory also here, then in my mind, it becomes like a, multi-core processor. So then it becomes a core by itself. I, I feel it's not a core because it doesn't have a memory. So that's my definition. <laughs> but, but certainly it's possible. In fact, actually, some, some of the things that we have really wanted to have is that instead of instructions flowing from here every cycle, you could actually have a small instruction memory, and the instructions could go from there, and that would reduce the power consumption even more. Uh, so there are a lot of options. Uh, this option uh, allows you to do uh, software pipelining of the loop at a higher level. Otherwise, it becomes like a uh, open MP kind of mapping, right? So where you map threads onto each core, right? While this one is actually all it's trying to do is uh, trying to accelerate one uh, loop in unison. Let's thank the speakers, please. Thank you.